Hi, um, I'm Kate Hutton, K6HTN, and I'm, if you're from Los Angeles section, I'm your section traffic manager. And what you are here for is traffic school with the TFC as traffic, which is our normal abbreviation. We have a few things to take care of before we start. First of all, we're videoing this class, as I'm sure you're all well aware. So um, if you have a problem with being in front of the camera, you might want to sit in the back. And if you're a uh, quote ham, you can sit in the front. <laughs> um, and it's nice that we have a fairly compact group here uh, so that we can have some interaction. If you have any questions during, during the presentation, uh, raise your hand and I'll try to, if they're covered later in the talk, I'll put it off, but otherwise I'll try to answer them. Um, and restrooms are down the hall that way and around the corner. Uh, feel, feel free to eat in class if you want to, uh, but please, because of the video, turn off or uh, down your cell phone uh, so we don't have too many interruptions. Any, uh, oh, and by the way, I, I'm sniffling because of allergies. I'm not contagious, so you can still shake my hand or whatever. Um, any issues, questions? Uh, Dennis, do you have anything you want to uh, address? Okay. Dennis is our section emergency coordinator. I thought he'd give him a chance to talk. Uh, yes. Stand by one. Here it is. Oh, it's a reference that we get later on. Okay, what we're going to do is we're going to have an overall view of the national traffic system, uh, what it's for and how we use it and so forth and uh, details of the message format, message uh, passing on the nets and so forth. And at the end of the class, you should be fit to write messages, check into uh, an FM repeater or simplex net and pass the message and have it go through the system. And you also be competent to receive messages and deliver them. Okay, and I can give you um, hints on where to look if you're interested in digital uh, communications for the NTS and if you're interested in CW. And the, the national tra traffic system is an, an, used to be a very major part of the ARRL. It's not so much anymore, uh, but we still have uh, an impossible to get patch. Uh, and a lot of people ask us why do we ha why do we keep doing this? Okay, why do why not just send an email? Okay, well, obviously one of the answers is that um, the email might not always work. The uh, your cell phone might be dead, the battery might be dead, the cell towers might be down. We know uh, as emergency communicators in Aries and other groups that that kind of thing happens. Um, it's also a very excellent training for message handling in general, even if you don't become part of the NTS. If you are skilled in message handling, uh, you'll be spotted as extraordinarily competent in the ARIES drills and emergency activations and so forth. Um, and also because it's fun. It, it is like contesting and direction finding and all these other aspects of ham radio. There are devotees. and. Several of them are here in this room. And I think this is the bottom line. This is a, a, a photo that I got for, talked out of the ARRL for the purpose of putting it in the slideshow. It's from Katrina at a shelter. And um, there wasn't any way uh, to get messages out to relatives and friends outside of the disaster area except to send a message. Uh, by by the NTS over the radio. Uh, again, just to I'm going through this because several times in different ways because it's important. NTS maintains we, when I say long haul, I mean cross country uh, and into Canada. Um, message handling service. Um, it's good training for emergency communicators and training for directed net operations. Uh, nobody has more complex directed nets than the NTS. 
and it's, uh, it's a great way to train in that. Um, it's great for honing basic operating skills like knowledge of what to do during a CME or a solar flare <laughs> or whatever that we had this week. Uh, training in, uh, I started personally with the NTS because it was good code practice and it sort of grew on me. Uh, it's a place where young operators can have quite a bit of responsibility. No one cares if net control or even the net manager is 14 years old as long as the job gets done. Okay, so it, it gives an opportunity for young people um, here and grow more so around the country. Uh, we are playing trivia games, playing chess, uh, having casual discussions, acknowledging QSL cards, everything like that through radiograms. It's good for Elmering opportunities. If you pick up a message on the NTS that says welcome or congratulations on your new ham license uh, and the person lives near you and you call them up to deliver the message, you can invite them to your club or, uh, you know, make some kind of uh, uh, Elmering relationship that can help them get started in ham radio. And of course you can get extra points on field day by uh, passing radiograms. You can get 100 points for just sending one radiogram to your section emergency coordinator or section manager. Okay, And you can get 10 points each for, each for 10 additional radiograms to anybody as long as they get passed during field day. Okay, so I don't know if you if you knew about that, but uh, come up here and get one of these. Um, oh yes, uh, and you can send quaint retro greetings to your friends, and it gets their attention. You know, I mean, and yeah, I had a birthday. I got another card. Oh, that's nice. You know, put it on the put it on the mantle, but. Uh, if I get a radiogram from somebody, that's, that's unusual. That's noteworthy, okay? And so you can do that. Uh, okay, so let's get down to business here. Let's say so somebody calls you on the phone, and this, is, this happened to me, okay, and the, it gives me this message. Greetings by Amateur Radio. Welcome to the Fists Club. We are glad to have you with us and hope you enjoy the fun and fellowship of the organization. Okay? So how did that message, where did it come from, and how did it get here? I think that's the first question. Um, FIST is a CW club, and so when the, the guy that delivered it found, out that, found that out and found out that I was interested in CW, he said, oh, well, we have a CW traffic net. You can join us. You know, so it, there was an Elmering opportunity there. This is what the message looked like. In its, in its native form when it was traveling through the system. Okay, there is a, I'm going to go through this a lot of times, a preamble with routing information, an address section, a message, and a signature. And then something at the bottom that says end. Okay, and so those are the parts of a radiogram. And these things that are underlined are pro signs in CW. So that's sort of, sort of like markup for a, radiogram. And how did it get here uh, from Michigan to Pasadena? Uh, it was relayed through the National Traffic System, or the NTS. Um, and in this case, it went through what we call the manual nets, which means operators sitting there at their desk, either talking or sending code um, through the airwaves. And the history of, uh, well, the history of message relay goes back to Hiram Percy Maxim wanting to buy some tube from somebody and not being able to get them on the radio, okay? Um, and was instrumental in the formation of the ARRL to start with, okay? Um, it was reorganized in the 1940s when uh, frequency control became reliable enough that people could actually meet at a certain time on a certain frequency and get together into what we call a net. Now, nets are very common now, okay? Uh, and the first nets were set up to pass messages. They're, they were called traffic nets, and they still are. 
Um, and the first digital implementation came in the 1990s in the form of PACTOR, a PACTOR mailbox system, which I'll talk about later. And here's a little map of what I, uh, stand by one. <laughs> Um, our friend Judy K6FRG has put together, I don't have this on the slide, but a nice little public relations uh, diagram of how somebody sends a message, it goes to a ham radio operator and it goes across the country over the airwaves and then somebody on the local end calls. Okay. So that's the, the um, general view of how, how the message gets from one place to the other. But this is the part that you need to know. Um, and these are the nets right here that concern us here in Los Angeles section. We have a Los Angeles net, a Southern California VHF net, and a Southern California CW net. And all of those feed in and out of the sixth region where, you know, we have six in our call signs. Um, the sixth region traffic net, um, which feeds, and it feeds also to these other ones, but it feeds to the Pacific Area Net, which covers everything basically west of the Rockies, including Alaska and Hawaii. Um, and then we have, oops, hit the wrong button. We have operators called Transcontinental Corps that take the messages between the area nets. Okay, so it's a very hierarchy. Uh, like, for example, here's our routing of a state of a message to N1 IQI, and N1 is in um, Massachusetts, okay? So the message goes from, if I have that message, I check into the Los Angeles net here, and I find out who is the Region 6 representative, give them the message. And then they go to the Region 6 net, and they find out who is the Pacific Area Net representative and they give it to them. And then uh, this person said, the, the Pacific Area Net, they find out who the Station India TCC operator is for that night, gives it to them, and then they take it over to the Eastern Area Net, and then it goes down the chain, okay? And eventually it comes to a net that's equivalent to the Los Angeles Net on this end, and they call up N1IQI and say, I have a message for you, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Now, N1IQI gets a lot of messages. He sends a lot of messages. Okay, so he's probably going to get it on digital. He's probably not going to get it on a phone call. Um, but that's, this is the basic idea of how the national traffic system works. Anybody have questions about that? Okay. The... To reiterate, traffic originates at the local and section level, travels through the area, region, and TCC, if necessary, level, and is delivered at the local or section level. And this map is somewhat helpful. I think I have a, a copy of it on the wall in front of my shack. Um, the areas, or the regions, are not exactly the call sign areas because we have 12 regions and uh, like, for example, regions, what would be a seven call sign uh, actually includes two regions. And our region includes Nevada, which normally would be a seven call sign. So the regions are not exactly the same as the calling areas. But there's, in many cases, they're similar. Okay, so, and then this, this boundary is between the central area and the Pacific area and the eastern area versus the central area. Okay, we go up into Canada, okay, um, and theoretically we can go into the, air, the countries in Central and South America that have an agreement, third party agreement with us, uh, but we d actually don't have a structure set up to do it on a routine basis. Uh, it does come up when, a when there's a disaster though. Um, some of the big earthquakes in Mexico City, there were a lot of health and welfare messages that came out through traffic nets and went into the NTS system. Nets, and nets operate in, this is sort of like a message peristalsis thing, you know, they operate in cycles that move the traffic through, um, and the most common cycle that most uh, non, 
retired people get on is cycle four, which is in the evening. Uh, and the, the section net or local net would be at 7 p.m., followed by a region net, so the traffic can go outbound, uh, followed by an area net, followed by a, another region net, so the traffic can be inbound, and followed by another section net, although this is getting sort of late and we don't always have the, <laughs> the, the last one. Okay, so it allows the traffic to flow up at the beginning of the cycle and down at the end of the cycle. And then there are TCC operators that carry the messages back and forth. Some, somewhere, uh, I haven't been able to get it to run as an animated GIF, but I'd love to, is a, a tr 80 meter traffic net chart um, that shows, it's animated and it shows, uh, has got music to it and it shows little monkeys running back and forth between the area <laughs> nets, right? And these are the TCC operators, right? <laughs> <laughs> Who are the, actually the most skilled and have the best stations of anybody because they have to get through to their corresponding operator uh, on a daily basis, whether, no matter what the propagation sounds like. Yeah. A quick question. Uh, going back to the previous map, you were showing the different uh, geographic areas. What about uh, U.S. territories such as Puerto Rico, U.S. Guam, with the, again? Okay, Puerto Rico is part of area f or area region four right here, which is part of the eastern area. Hawaii is part of um, six, six, region six. Guam would be included? Um, I mean, Guam, I believe, is included in Region 6. Okay, I've never seen a message go there, so I'm not 100% sure, but uh, it's, it's done. Okay. A lot of times, you know, the, this part of the net of the system is exercised d very well, uh, but if we have a message for a foreign country, nobody really knows what to do with it. Um, Dennis, who um, lives half-time in the Philippines and his wife is in the Philippines, sent a radiogram to his wife and I saw it bounce around several times in the, within the NTS because no one knew what to do with it. And um, shall we say every time it went through, the Philippines was spelled differently. <laughs> uh, and it was finally delivered by Skype. Okay. Um, and you know, like, okay, well, that's not really preparing for disaster. Well, it actually is because if there's a disaster here, the only thing we have to do is get the message outside of the disaster zone to where everything else is working. And then the first person with power who has a Skype is gonna deliver the message. They're not gonna send it all the way through the nets to the other end, okay, in a disaster. That's how it's gonna work. Uh, but the, the daily nets and everything, that um, gives us practice on how to, how to do everything. And you have to go back and you have to realize that this stuff was set up when long distance phone calls were expensive Okay, um, and ham radio operators showed up at the county fair and took messages for people. You know, it's like, okay, do you want to send a birthday greeting to your Aunt Mary in Indiana, you know? And people did that. They thought it was novel. It was sort of like the cell phones of that day, okay? Um, and, you know, we don't have that function anymore. We've moved into the function of being prepared for disasters and training people how to handle messages for, for um, how to handle any message accurately, okay? And we are the only, that I know of, we're the only um, ham radio, one branch of ham radio that practices every day, okay? I don't think there is any other group that does that. They, you know, they have drills, they have, you know, whatever, but we, we practice every day. Not the same people every day necessarily, but there's, there are traffic nets every day. Christmas, New Year's. Okay, now we have cycle four, we have parts of cycle two, uh, but these other cycles are available. You know, they could be filled in if the traffic was high enough, if there were a major earthquake in California or, so, you know, something came up like that. Um, we could up, open up these cycles, okay. And this is how it works. <laughs> this is the crux of the talk right here. <laughs> And the, the reason that I say that is it's a complex operation 
no, this person right here working with these blue balls doesn't know much about what happened over here. All that they know is that the message is coming through and this is what I have to do with it. And it goes where it's going to go, okay? It's, it's sort of a, a churning mechanism, message and passing mechanism, okay? Um, it, that currently covers about half the messages that go through, what I just described. The other half is going through NTSD, which is uh, National Traffic System Digital. Okay. And NTSD covers the long haul part. It doesn't really cover the local um, pickup and delivery part of it. Um, but on the long haul, it's complete. It's parallel to the NTS manual nets, independent of net times, uh, meaning that traffic can be passed automatically at all times of the day or night. Um, carries about half the load, and at it itself is fairly ancient in the sense that it's, it goes through um, PACTOR MBO operation, a mailbox operation, uh, that automatically relays messages through uh, HF without going through the internet at all. So, and in that sense, it's prepared for disaster the way ham radio should be. Um, and there are, each area and region and hopefully section has at least one <coughs> mailbox operation where digital relay stations like myself can connect and pick up messages for my area, okay? And then I take them to the local nets and find people who are willing to make the phone calls to deliver the messages, okay? Uh, is this type of traffic, the digital traffic, I want to rephrase my question correctly. Does it handle only digital traffic? Or if, if I were to send a, a, a message across country, all right, I get on, provide the message, will somebody then put it into okay, if you, format? Okay, can you repeat the question? Back? The question is about, um, I think what you're asking is how do I get a message to go into the digital system? Yes. Okay. okay. And, uh, uh, most people, if they're not a DRS already, yeah. they would check into a local net yeah. and they would say, I have a message and you'll list it for RN6 mm -hmm. because that means it's outbound, mm -hmm. okay? And you would give it to somebody who calls themselves the RN6 rep for that. Um, and you don't know whether they actually take it to the CW net or whether they put it on digital. Ah, okay. okay. Um, I'm going to get a little more to the, in the end of the talk, I'm going to talk about how you can get directly into NTSD. There, that is possible. Uh, but the, they're the same messages. They're just radiograms. They're text messages with a preamble, an address, text, and signature. Could I, as an initiator of a message, specify which one I would prefer handling by? Yeah, I'll show, uh, later in the talk I'll discuss how to do that. Any, any other questions? Uh, and we have lately been given a third option here, which is radio email. Uh, it's basically Winlink 2000, uh, which NTS has adopted as another tool, okay? Uh, and part of it is getting in and out of the NTSD, okay? So that would be the secret for how, if you, you would have to know the format um, for sending a message and you'd have to know your, who your local MBO was and you would send it to them, and that would go on to the NTSD, okay? Uh, and it has some advantages. Uh, it's pretty widely accessible. You do not have to have, you can get through it, di through it on Pactor, Winmore on HF, and Packet, so you don't have to have the $1,200 Pactor TNC, okay? You can, you, there are cheaper ways to do it. Um, you would send the, the radio email to a gateway station, uh, a Winlink gateway station, where it would automatically go onto the internet, okay? Or you could direct it, if you send it to the MBO, you would, uh, you know, I'm not gonna confuse things right here with the MBO, I'm gonna get to that again later. But if you wanna send, if let's look at a disaster situation and let's say I have to get this message um, which is an email message or 
or a radiogram in, embedded in an email message um, outside my disaster area so it can go on the internet and go through the internet to my mother in Massachusetts, right? Um, this, is, this might be how I would do it because it would travel by radio until it could get on the internet and then it would go. And although it's generalized email format, it can be used by and it is used by NTS to carry radiograms. But they still have to be pretty darn small files because if you're lucky on HF, it's 300 baud. If you're unlucky, it's 100. <laughs> okay. Uh, the nodes, the modes that are used in the frequencies are chosen conveniently based on the geographic area that you have to cover by the net, um, by the likely propagation, by who's available and what equipment they have. Um, and that especially applies in an emergency when you're not going to be sure in, ahead of time what you actually have on hand to do the job. And of course, every mode has its advantages and disadvantages. And we all know the advantages of CW, it gets through on poor conditions, it's spectrum efficient and so forth. Um, some people don't realize that it's actually faster than voice, and I'll explain why it is that's true in a minute. Uh, and the disadvantage is obviously that it's hard to find good CW operators. So, um, uh, voice is the other way around, especially, um, well, it's really the other way around. It's easy to find people who are skilled with um, sideband and FM operations. Uh, but on the other hand, it's affected by propagation badly. Uh, it's sometimes, it's, well, overall slower than going through CW. And both those two are vulnerable to operator fatigue and so forth. There's just all these different, uh, different things that you need to consider. Um, digital avoids the operator fatigue unless you have to sit there typing the messages for hours on end, then you get sort of tired. Um, it's accurate, oops, hit the wrong button again. And it's suitable for somewhat longer messages, although not too much longer. Um, but there are some disadvantages. It's difficult to track missing messages. There are typos. Uh, it's a little bit harder to set up and get the system to work. Um, and the bottom line is that the traffic still has to be cleared through the local nets in the end. So, um, you know, unless the digital stations wants to deliver all of them, which usually is not the case. Any questions before we get into the details of traffic nets? That was your overview of the NTS. No questions. Okay. Most of us are used to the Aries nets uh, where everybody checks in at the beginning by the section of the alphabet of their suffix, um, and then they check out at the end. And maybe there's uh, some announcements in the middle, okay? Uh, not too complex. All they want to do is they want to know that you can get to the simplex net or the repeater that the net is on and that you stay until you're checked out. Okay, that's um, the goal of an Aries net, I think. Um, in an NTS net, we have to do more than that. We have to pass messages. Uh, and each net has a net control station who makes all the decisions based on, or on how to do that based on uh, the traffic that's given to him. Um, we have liaison stations from other nets. For example, our local nets, they all have an, a liaison station from RN6 to pick up outgoing messages. Um, the, the Southern California net has a liaison to the Los Angeles net and vice versa. Okay, so that we can get messages to other parts. You know, Southern California cover, net covers San Diego and so forth as well as Los Angeles. So if we have messages to go there, uh, that liaison takes them. And for the section and local nets, we have many members who check in uh, and either give us traffic that they have uh, written themselves or they have gotten from third parties, or they take traffic that's incoming and agree to deliver it, okay. 
And these are really the, the, the work, what shall we say, the, the working core of the national traffic system, you know, because you need more of these than, in, than anybody else, really, uh, to make the system work. And, you know, they, uh, the same person is not going to be checking in every time. Okay, so you have to have a, a large pool of people to do this. They are generally not the fanatics, but they're, they're there and they're interested in learning to pass traffic in case of a disaster, or they're there for the social value of the traffic net. Um, even though we don't do chit chat on a traffic net, we become very close working relationships with our, our colleagues on the nets. And then we have a net manager who assigns the NCS duties per night, okay, and keeps up the records and statistics and everything. Because all of the statistics of the, all of the NTS, every message that passes through there becomes a statistic, okay. So we know how our nets are performing compared to what they were doing the same time last year, uh, the same time last solar cycle. Um, it's, it's all there somewhere. And the types of skills are needed vary. We need highly skilled operators to move large volumes of traffic at the upper levels. And we need um, NTSD operators would be somebody who could run an automated station and keep a Pactor uh, or a Winlink Classic software running on a Windows 98 computer, for example. You know, the, uh, some of the stuff that's software that's available for this is pretty old. So that's a skill. Um, and then we need, on the section in local nets, we need people to deliver and originate the traffic. So, um, and that, that may mean going to disaster preparedness events and uh, collecting radiograms from people, from the public there. Uh, send an out of town, or send a, a sample message to your out of town disaster contact, for example. Uh, that kind of thing. And all of these activities are likely to happen in an emergency. So uh, we need all these different types of people. And we need, you know, cycle four is traditionally a CW cycle, but cycle two is a sideband. So, you know, there's room for a lot of different types of operators available that are in the system. Uh, some of these nets, like Los Angeles and Southern California, are considered training nets, which means if you check in, and you've never been in a traffic net before, we'll talk you through it. And uh, make sure that you get the message written and transferred correctly and uh, get it on its way. Okay. And anybody is, who, who's got a ham license is basically uh, more than welcome to participate in any of these. And any, even, the, even the CW nets are on parts of the band which are accessible to techs. So, uh, I mean, admittedly, you have to learn code first, but it's, um, it's all, it's, you don't have to have a high <coughs> license class in order to do this. Uh, when you get up to RN6 and Pacific Area Net, however, uh, if you don't sound like they know what you're doing, you know what you're doing, they're likely to say, okay, thank you, you're excused. <laughs> okay. Uh, which means basically that we have 45 minutes to pass all this traffic and we don't have time to talk you through it. So there is some kind of a work up through the system uh, in NTS. You start um, passing messages on your local nets um, and as you get better, you get invited to go into the upper net. The PAA? Pa Pacific Area yeah. Net. That's, that's of course the Pacific. Pacific Area, yeah, right. And uh, there's CAN for Central Area and EAN for Eastern. Questions about nets? Oh, I'm sorry. One of the questions. The Pacific Area net that's United States we're talking about. We're not talking about foreign. Well, we go into Canada routinely. In Canada, yeah. yeah. Okay. But uh, none of the rest of it gets exercised on a daily basis. Okay, I, I have heard uh, stories about, uh, for example, big earthquakes in Mexico where uh, nets have been set up to take traffic in and out of Mexico. 
But generally, uh, the national traffic system was set up as a national traffic system. Okay. Okay, parts of a radiogram. I talked about the four parts before, and uh, this is pretty much the standard form, and there should be plenty of forms floating around. If not, I have more. Um, that you can use to um, make sure you don't forget anything when you're writing the message, okay? Uh, and the top part is the preamble, which is the routing information, okay? The second part is where it's going, okay? This is the message, and then the signature would go right in here. Um, and this stuff is for the record keeping of the operator, the radio operator. Preamble, address C section. I, I uh, shall we say repeat myself a lot for important stuff that I think is needs to sink in. Um, they give you 25 spaces here, uh, not because that's an absolute limit in a disaster. If it's necessary to go longer than that, you can, but because uh, the messages get pretty cumbersome if they're longer than that, if they're longer than about 25 words, yeah. Uh, do the satellites play any part in the uh, I don't think so. I have never heard of any. The, the contact time on an amateur satellite is pretty short. You wouldn't be able to get too much through there, I don't think. Unless you could do it on packet. That's possible. But I, the passes are just not, there's not enough time available to make it <coughs> worthwhile. Signature section, and uh, again, going back to what is actually sent over the air, uh, the message is, is uh, pretty, I mean, we still have five, groups of five, okay. Um, but it, it's, it, we don't, th let's just put it this way. If you've been in this for a while, you don't use the form very often, okay, you just write it out. Okay, but the forms are good to get started. The forms are good if you are delivering a message to somebody and you want to hand them a nice formal piece of paper, then you put it on the form, okay. Um, but you're gonna use the forms in the class to get started, okay. And this is an example of an answer to a trivia question. I said we play trivia games over the NTS, okay. So this is a pretty ridiculous message, uh, but what it does is it gives you some stuff that's hard to spell, so that's preparing you for medical information in a disaster that you might have to send, okay? It's fun, makes you think, makes you look up tri interesting trivia on the internet or whatever. Uh, this message is from, well, it's to me, from the Orange Section Traffic Manager, Bruce Hunter in, or in uh, Apple Valley. Okay, Apple Valley. And what I'm gonna go through here line by line and tell you what each thing is and how we would say it on the air. Okay, and the first thing is number one zero. We never say number 10, okay, because if I said 10, I would, the, the other person's gonna write T-E-N there, okay. What you say is number, I want, Really, it's number figures one zero, but in the preamble, we all know what the types are, so we don't, we don't have to go through that. So we go through the preamble, we say number one zero, okay? And this is, the originating station gets to make up what the number is for the radiogram. It's usually the first, by, sequentially through a month or sequentially through a year, so they can, if it's a question about the, the radiogram, they can, go back and find it in their files, okay? That's all the number is. It's a convenience for the originating station. Uh, okay, uh, mm. the few messages I handled, that, that sequence I found utterly confusing, okay? If I originated a message, I would assign a sequence to it, mm -hmm. okay? The message then would go on okay, mm -hmm. to be delivered. And w when the next person picks up the message and delivers it, it's his number that appears no. on it? It's my no. number that appears This number should stay with the message through its entire 
And if it's ever referred to in a pre in a in a later radiogram, yeah. it will be W six WW's message one zero, date April three zero. Okay, but if the if the message G again if the person receiving it returns a message to me, the initiator of that particular message assigns his, his number, number, references my number. In the text. In the text. In the text he he may say in the, when they comes back to to you, the text may say regarding your number one zero, and then the rest of the text. Okay, okay, Connie, I got it. I got it. Yeah. It causes a lot of trouble when radiograms change number yeah. in in the process. That's uh, I, I don't recommend. I mean, it's not to say it's not done, but it it really screws up the system. Okay. When when it does, when you have to trace a message, and that has happened, it really gets screwed up. Okay. And some people start; they have a four-digit number, and the first number is the month. Like a lot of the messages that are going through now are seven thousand something, right? So it's it's this, the seven is represents July, and then the other three numbers represent the the sequence within July. I actually use a sequence for the whole year myself. I start with number one in January and go all the way to the end. Yeah. How many characters can be in that number? I've never seen more than four. Four. I don't think there's any rule about it, but it could be. You try to keep it uh, simple enough so that the relay is not going to cause problems. Fours are pretty. Four-digit numbers are pretty common, though. And when I say this uh, on the air, I always say, generally we say here is number, you know, and that here is number is um, get your pencil ready and get ready to write, okay? Or you're typing paper in the, in the typewriter, you know, whatever. Um, okay, now we have precedence. This is the next thing. 99.9% .9 of all radiograms are precedence routine, or are, right here, routine. When we read this, the preamble is special because it's a specific sequence and we don't have to go through a lot of the um, <coughs> rigmarole that we have to go to pass plain text, okay? Uh, so we would say number one zero routine, okay? But we would only write R. The, um, there are four possibilities. There's, well, more, uh, five really. Routine, W, which would be health and welfare message in a disaster. You know, I'm okay, I'm in the shelter in Houston, you know, whatever. Um, P for priority, which could be something like uh, a shelter ordering medical supplies or cots or something like that that has to get through a be a ahead of the routine messages. Okay, and then there's emergency spelled out, which is basically the category that's defined by the FCC of uh, life and pro danger to life and property. Okay, so that you don't go you're not going to see that very often. Even in a disaster, you're probably not going to see it very often. Um, okay. Yeah. If you were to spell out emergency, would it be public safety kinetics or you know, amateur radio kinetics? Because it's in the pre hitting the wrong button. <laughs> because it's in the preamble, everybody knows what the choices are when you get to this spot. There has to be one of these four. Okay. So um, you can say emergency. You won't need to spell it phonetically. Uh, I just want to say always spelled out. Yeah, n no, it doesn't mean it's spelled out phonetically. Okay. Uh, and then, then the other option, there, there is a test option here in a drill you can send a message with priority test W, test P, or test emergency, okay? And then you have to have the word drill or test at the first and last word in the text so that you don't scare the whatever F out of anybody, okay? Questions about that so far? Okay, a lot of people get confused by handling instructions which is the, 
this right here. Um, in CW, there are a lot of abbreviations that end in X, okay? This is just a class of word in CW. And HX, HX means handling instructions, okay? WX means weather, TX means transmitter, you know, that kind of stuff. HX means handling instructions, okay? And there are special handling instructions that you can use, but they're optional. So if you're starting out, you might want to not use them, okay? Um, the common ones are um, HXC, uh, which means for the delivering station, when you deliver this radiogram, uh, send me a message back saying that you delivered it. Okay, that way the sending station knows that the message actually got delivered. Okay, it's going to be a while, okay, because the message has to go through the system twice and come back, okay. Um, but that's what HXC means. HXE goes a little further than that, and it says, please ask the receiving party, the third party, for a reply. Okay, so if I sent a message out that said HXCE, I would expect to get two radiograms back. I would get one that uh, was signed by the delivering station from the HXC, and I would get one signed by the person I sent the message to, the third party person, um, with the answer. Okay. HXF is useful. It's, uh, if you're sending a birthday greeting, you'd sort of like to have the person call on the person's birthday and deliver the message. Okay. So HXF followed by a number, HXF15 would mean, uh, please deliver this message tomorrow, the 15th of the month. Okay. So that, uh, and typically we say HXC is used primarily. HXG is actually used more than anybody, more than any. And HXG is sort of means that this message is a lower than low priority because if you have to spend a dime on a long distance phone call, don't bother. Okay. Um, I actually don't like this one. I don't like giving the impression that the message is so worthless that you don't have to deliver it. <coughs> okay. Um, but a lot of people do use it. Judy, do you have something to say? No. Okay. <laughs> yes. Uh, you say they still hand deliver some of these things or it's all done over the phone? Uh, the only time I would hand deliver, th well, yeah, sometimes. If, if I'm going to an Aries meeting the next day and I have a message for somebody who I expect to be at that meeting, I'll just, yeah. Robert. Now, I think this actually would happen more in a disaster. If the phones weren't working, right, uh, you might be called upon to take the message directly to the person's address and stick it under the door, you know, or hand it to them or whatever. Uh, there's, you know, what, delivering messages is pretty easy in normal times, but you might have to think about how you might be, have to be creative uh, if the phones or the, or the email or whatever wasn't working. Okay, um, and this is all part of the preparation for the big one, right? <laughs> yeah. Can you, can there be more than one request? Like, do you want to know the time that was uh, delivered and the expected response? Or yeah, you just email? stick them together. H, X, C, E. F. 25. I mean, you, you can string them together. You might get some eyebrows raised along <laughs> the way. Uh, and you know, the, the farther you go outside of the normal conventions, the more errors come in as, you, as the message travels. So you have to keep that in mind, too. Okay, the, this is the originating station. Okay, and this is the ham that put the message on the air the first time. Okay. Um, in this case, the originating station and the 
sender of the message is the same person. Okay, but it doesn't have to be. Somebody in Hemet could have called up W6WW on the, because he knew he was a traffic handler, um, on the phone and said, please originate a message for me to uh, somebody in, in New York. Okay, and W6WW would have helped them over the phone write the message and he would have put it out on a piece of paper, but he would have been the originating station, okay? But Hemet would have been here. I'll get to that in another couple of slides. The check is something that we get a lot of questions about also. It's basically the number of dashes in the text line, you know, that when you go back to uh, here, we have 25 possible words that we can stick in here, okay? And it's the number of spaces that have been used in that text, okay? And what it is, is a way to check to see if something's missing. And I have actually seen a message go through uh, where the word not was omitted, which makes a big difference in the meaning, okay? And the problem was caught because the check was wrong. Okay, and the two operators on the air figured out what the problem was, inserted the word not where it was supposed to be, and f problem fixed. Okay, so that's why we have the check there. Yeah. In the radiogram on your curve, you can go back a couple of times. Yeah, where you have the red arrow there. You just put the third letter in there. Yeah, you just put the C or the E. But when you send it out, you need to say the whole thing. You need to say Hotel X-Ray Charlie. Don't just say Charlie, okay? Don't want to check two five. Okay, so this is a number of words in the text. Um, does not include the preamble, address, or signature. It's just the text, okay? And any of these things here could be a word. Radiogram, 7-3, N6HD, any of these is one word in the t as far as the check is concerned. Uh, we don't use punctuation except the word query, Q-U-E-R-Y, for a question mark and the word X, or the letter X for uh, a, a period, or a separator between sentences. Not really a period, because you don't use it at the end, but it's a separator between sentences, if it's unclear otherwise. Okay. Is okay. The, the X is written out, and the word query is also written out in replacement of the... Uh, X is just a letter. Initial X, initial X-ray okay. is an X, okay. And query is written out as, it, as a word. If you have a hyphen, hyphen is written out. Uh, okay. Not just a hyphen. Yeah. A slash is written out. No, that's actually, that's not true. Slash is slash. acceptable as part of a word. I'll give you some examples of that. Um, uh, in CW, when you send a decimal number, you can use R in place of the decimal plate. And that's legal in the radiogram. So you had a magnitude 7.8 earthquake, and it's uh, that word in the radiogram would be 7R8. And if you listen to the W1AW code practice, they do that a lot. That's how they represent decimal numbers in, in their CW. What is a group? Any of these words, figures, call signs? So they aren't really words, right? Your call sign's not a word. No. Uh, so you have to generalize it a little bit. It's a group. A word is a group. A call sign is a group. 7-3 uh, oh. is a group. Oh, so it's a group of letters and yeah, numbers yeah, together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a group. Right, yeah. As opposed to a word, like right. total. Right, uh. Okay, so when I'm reading this, I go, uh, here is number one, zero, routine, hotel, x-ray, echo, whiskey, six, whiskey, whiskey, two, five. Never 25, just two, five, okay. 
And I should put in here the reason for having all of these um, formalized ways of saying things is because when the propagation is terrible, you don't want to have too many options, okay? You want to be able to know what's to be expected in this slot, okay? And so, so it's not too confusing. You want to introduce too many errors, okay? That's the reason for having all this formalized traffic passing stuff. It has a function. It's not just tradition, okay? Okay, now we get, I talked a little bit about the place of origin. The place is where the signature, the person signing the radiogram, the person sending the message is from or is at the time, okay? It's not necessarily the place the originating station is. They can be the same, but they don't have to be. And I would say in the preamble, I can say California as um, California. Okay, I could say Apple Valley, California, and that's, that's clear. Even though we only write CA, we don't write the whole California out. Question? Yes. I was a little confused about the wording uh, <coughs> for the party for whom the message was created. Is that the originator of the message or the destination of the message? Or is it the party for whom, oh, uh, <coughs> That's the the, sta the person that signs the message at the bottom, named in the signature section. Okay. In the address, he uses yeah. zip code, but not in the preamble. Okay, time filed, you, you hardly ever see this in routine messages. It's just going by the day. But if there's a disaster going on, you probably want to include the time filed so that uh, the person who gets the message knows how old it is. And that could be read how? As? Zero, zero, one, five, Zulu. Okay. On the air, I've heard several people refer to it as figures, zero, zero, one, five, Zulu. Well, it's actually mixed group zero zero one five Zulu. Okay, mixed group. In the preamble, we don't need to have those pr those introducers. Okay. okay. This will make more sense when I get into the text. Okay. Okay. Um, but the preamble is so precisely set up ahead of time that you can just zip through it. You don't have to put in a lot of extra uh, okay. explanation. But if you know, if you get to the state, and the next thing somebody says is numbers. It's not April, okay? It's not a month, okay? It's, it's probably the time, okay? So you, you, there's only a couple of options of what it can be in this place in the preamble. Okay. No, but why did I do that? I'm really jumping around. Okay, uh, this is optional. If you start out doing this, don't use it, okay? Until you get used to the rest of everything. Don't put, don't put the time in. The date's necessary, though, and it's, we always use the three-letter, even though we say April when we're talking, sending this on the air, we say April, the other person writes down APR because it's in the preamble and we know what is supposed to go there, okay? And then we say three zero, not 30, three zero, okay? If you... Put a Zulu time here. Make sure the date is also the Zulu date, which means the time change is at 5 o'clock in the afternoon here. It's not midnight. Okay. Does that mean if you're not using Zulu time, you use local date? Well, if you, if you are not using Zulu time, you better put PT there so that it's clear because they will assume Zulu if you don't say it, what it is. I'm sorry, say it again? It, well, if, if you don't put Zulu there, if it's just the figures, right. by convention, people will assume it's Zulu. Yeah. But if it's actually Pacific time, you should put PT there instead of Zulu. But if there's no time listed, do you use local date or Zulu date? You use the same date as the time. <laughs> OK. And if there is no time? If there's no time, it doesn't matter because 
It's only specified within one day anyway. Okay. Questions so far? Can you redefine what you put in check? Check is the number of groups in the message text. Okay. But it's not the number of characters, it's the number, number of groups. Word, no. Number of groups. Okay, Bruce, what was that signal? I to change the page here around 10 seconds. Okay, break. Good. Time for break. <laughs> the bathrooms are down the hall and